Lecture number six, The Comfort of God. We begin this lecture with the big picture, showing how the second half is different from the first half. We will talk about the frequently used words in the second half, such as the words comfort, servant. We are going to talk about who Isaiah is referring to when he says servant. Of course, we are going to highlight Isaiah 53. Um, we, we're going to end this series with a call to all of us to trust God, the main theme of this book. Chapter 1 to 39 is the Book of Judgment, referred by some because it is largely about judgment, with some restoration passages inserted. Chapter 40 to 66 is the Book of Comfort because that is largely the content, but has also some judgment passages. Now, why do I write 39 plus 27 equals 66 on the PowerPoint slide? How many books are there in the Bible? 66 books. How many in the Old Testament? 39. How many in the New? 27. How many chapters in the first division of Isaiah? Again, 39. How many in the second division? Again, 27. Hmm, interesting. Is this a coincidence? Yes, of course. But there is more to say. The second division of 27 chapters is divided into three sections of equal length, nine chapters each. In the middle of the middle section of this so-called Book of Comfort is Isaiah 53 the most famous messianic prophecy of the entire Bible. The clearest, the most detailed, the most obvious, and that is exactly in the center of the book of comfort. Wow, I, I, I do find that interesting. In the second division, there is a, a clear message of comfort. The word comfort is used right in the beginning, chapter 40 verse 1, and in the end, 66 verse 13, and a couple more times in between, as you can see on the PowerPoint. Chapter 49 and 54, chapter 54 repeatedly says the Lord will have compassion over you. And there will be promises of healing protection, restoration, guidance, and deliverance. All words of comfort to a people living in evil times. And all the references you find on the PowerPoint. Now, in the midst of confusion, isolation, despair, it says that God will not forget you. Chapter 49, verse 15. He will bring you joy. Chapter 51, verse 11, 55, verse 12, etc. Again, you'll see it on the PowerPoint. And that you will know him intimately. Chapter 43, verse 10, 50, 45, verse 3 and 6, 52, verse 6. Isaiah says repeatedly, do not fear. Chapter 40, verse 9, 41, verse 10, etc. Again, refer back to the PowerPoint. When the circumstances cause you to worry a lot, when you are under a lot of distress, it is comforting to hear God say, fear not. It's all going to work out at the end, he says. The second division begins and ends much like the New Testament. Each of the Gospels in the New Testament start out with, prepare the way of the Lord, as does Isaiah 40, chapter 40, verse 3, New Testament ends with Revelation, where we read about the new heaven and the new earth, as does Isaiah in 66, verses 22 and 23. In the first division, the Assyrians are the main threat. First, are the main threat, first in the background, then it comes to the foreground. 
In the second division, there is this Babylonian threat already in the background. Isaiah is promising deliverance from Babylon, a type or foreshadow for salvation from sin, much like deliverance from Egypt in Exodus was also a picture of salvation from sin. In the first division we see God, the King. Isaiah saw a vision of God and says, I saw the Lord high and lifted, seated upon the throne. The picture is God on the throne. He dwells in a high and holy place. We also see God the judge. The rule of law is enforced using the threat of judgment. We see the Lord of hosts judging, bringing vengeance upon sinners. The first division can be summed up as a day of vengeance. See 54 verses 7 and 8. Now the second division is entirely different from the first and we will see God's greatest revelation and that is Jesus. This is the ultimate disclosure of God to his people. Jesus said, when you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Think of how this this revelation progresses. The book begins with a king, which everyone would have expected, but ends with a servant. God the servant. That took everybody by surprise. That took everyone's breath away. So much emphasis on servanthood is in this book. It shouldn't, should not be a surprise when Jesus came and taught us that we should be servants. When the disciples were arguing about who is the greatest, Jesus replied in Luke chapter 22 verse 27, For who is greater, the one who is at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one at the table? But I am among you as one who serves. When Jesus said, I am among you as one who serves, it was not a new idea. It was already prophesied that this was Jesus, that this is what Jesus would be like in Isaiah. And that is, he will be a servant. He would be a servant. The second division is where God's grace and mercy is dominant. We see God who saves, who delivers, who helps, who protects and redeems. Only here the revelation of himself being the Savior is mentioned. In 43 verse 3, verse 11, 45 verse 15, verse 21, 26, 49 verse 22, 26, verse 60. No, I'm sorry, not verse 60, but chapter 60, verse 16, chapter 63, verse 8. This is reinforcing the theme of redemption for the second half of the book. And that he is the only Savior is stressed in 43 verse 11. So where we have God the judge in the first half, in the second half we see God the Savior. In the second division we really get to, get to what God delights in. Paul in Romans says, Judgment is God abandoning us. He gave us up to our own degrading passions and sins. But now he wants to have us back. He made us for a relationship with him. Wrath was only for a brief moment. Vengeance only for a day, it says in 61 verse 2. But God's love is for eternity. The Lord's favor for a whole year in 61 verse 2. In summary, for the whole book of Isaiah, we have a king and a servant, a judge and a savior. What is pictured is a throne and a cross. In Isaiah 6, when he sees the Lord, he hears angels cry out the words, Holy, holy, holy. But when we get to Isaiah 53, we read that a holy God 
is numbered with the transgressors. A holy God identified with sinners. And God makes himself very vulnerable in the second half of the book. Remember God's love song over the vineyard that was lost because it had no fruit in chapter 5? Well, God's heart is broken. In chapter 65, verses 1 and 2, we read, I was constantly stretched out, stretching out my hands to them, saying, Here am I, to a bunch of people who simply didn't want to follow me. Of course, I am paraphrasing. He is a father reaching out his hand, but the son simply refuses. A father reaching out to embrace, but the son simply walks away. Remember the heart cry of God, the father in the book of Isaiah? He makes himself vulnerable. God is weeping because his children have abandoned him. But God cannot forget his children and comes to the rescue. He sends his son the servant. When we trace the word servant in Isaiah, we will see that the word is one time used for Isaiah himself, such as in uh, Isaiah 20 verse 3, but the word is really used a lot only in a second division where it can mean the nation Israel or Jesus, or the church. Isaiah the servant, in 20, chapter 20, verse 3, when he was called to go naked for three years and prophesy against Egypt and Ethiopia, God calls Isaiah, my servant. Servants, supposed to serve, make sacrifices for his master. Isaiah was called servant, when he was called by God to walk around naked for three years. That requires humility, dying to oneself, be willing to be vulnerable and be mocked at. It was an enacted symbol to shock people. It was just as shocking then, in that culture, than it is today. You just don't do that. But it sure gets people's attention. Israel, the blind servant. In 41 verse 8, God calls also Israel, my servant. Later, in 42 verse 19, he calls servant, if he call Israel a servant that is blind. As a nation, they were to serve God by being a witness to the world. As descendants of Abraham, they were to be a blessing to nations, and they failed in that because they were not willing to pay the price of being a servant, they didn't want to humble themselves. Paul says in Romans 2 verse 24, that God's name is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of Israel. A servant could be punished. A slave could be punished. Even be put to death if he fails to serve his master well. Instead, God says, I will redeem my servant. Chapter 48, verse 20. Jesus, the servant. In 42, verse 1, God presents a new servant, but now one with a capital S, meaning, of course, Jesus. This verse is quoted in Matthew 12, verses 18 to 20, to explain the servant is Jesus. God again says... My servant. Now, our hope is now in him. Why? Because God placed his spirit upon him, and he will bring forth justice to the nations. Instead of letting the blasphemy among the nations to continue, he now himself fulfills the task of being that witness to the, nation, uh, to the nations that Israel was supposed to have been. Jesus will become the true Israel. God took on the form of a servant and humbled himself even to the point of death. Philippians 2, verse 6 and 2, 8. He paid the ultimate sacrifice of being a servant.
the church, the servants, now in the plural. Now we go back to the small letter S again. This time it is a plural, though, and the word servants is used. It speaks of the church. In 54 verse 17, the promise is that no weapon that is fashioned against the church shall prosper. True power is not in being the boss, but in being a servant. God's kingdom is totally different from the kingdoms of the world. That is why Jesus said, if you want to be great in his kingdom, you are to be everyone's servant. You and I are challenged by the question and should meditate on it when reading the ultimate description of a servant in Isaiah 53. Do I really want to be God's servant? Remember, there is a price to be paid, sacrifice to be made. In the first division, we see that songs of praise were used at the end of each major cycle of judgment and restoration. The first cycle is chapter 1 to 12, judgment and restoration of Judah. And at the end we have the song of salvation. The second major title, major cycle, is chapter 13 to 27, and it is about judgment and restoration of the nations. And at the end, we have the song of the pleasant vineyard. The third major cycle is, uh, again, judgment and restoration of Ju Judah. And at the end, we have the song of the restored Zion. At the end of each cycle, you can distinguish a mini-apocalypse of judgment and restoration, and then Isaiah burst out in worship. Again, the references are mine that are given on the PowerPoint. Not everybody agrees what the references should be. But the seven, the seven songs I have are in 42 verses 10 to 13, the song of God's servant. In 44 verse 23, the song of redeemed Israel. 49 uh, 49 verse 13, the song of the servant bringing light to the nations. 52 verse 7 and to 10, the song of the servant bringing salvation to all the nations. 54 verses 1 to 3, the song of the barren woman, descendants shall possess the nations. And the song of the mountains and trees in chapter 55 verse 12. And then the last one I have is the song of God's servant inheriting the new heaven and the new earth in chapter 65 verses 13 and 14. I do not have to make some arti artificial break in my horizontal. The author does that with a phrase to divide the first and second section and then again with, with the second and third section. At the end of the first nine chapters, we read 48, verse 22, There is no peace, says my God, for the wicked. Then at the end of the second section of nine chapters, we see that same phrase again in 57, verse 21. 
Then all the way at the end of the book, a graphic picture is given of the destiny of the wicked. Their corpses will decompose for all eternity. They will rot in hell. Chapter 66, chapter 66 verse 24. So the ending of each section is a pointed warning to the wicked. Some say the second half of the book was written during the reign of Manasseh, when the nation dived deep into idolatry again, infant sacrifice, immorality, etc. Not sure if this is true, because this king is not mentioned in chapter 1, verse 1 of Isaiah. But if true, imagine this. We know that Manasseh was so bad that the exile of Judah was sealed during his reign. God has made, his mind, made up his mind. It's going to happen. Exile is going to happen. You can read this in 2 Kings 21, verses 1 to 18. And it was during this time of deep darkness and wickedness that God gave the greatest revelation of Jesus. Manasseh may have been one of the very first to hear it. It was during his time that to all of mankind was revealed to what extent God wants to go to bring all men back into relationship with God. Manasseh, Manasseh may have been one of the first to have heard the gospel. In chapter 40 to 48, the big theme through the section is the promise of redemption. Isaiah sees in visions that Judah will be in captivity in Babylon. He then prophesies deliverance from the captivity and the deliverer is mentioned by name right in the center of the book and that his name is Cyrus. He is the Persian conqueror of Babylon who released the Jews, enabling them to go home. In the middle of this section, the prophecy is given by name in 44 verse 28, 45 verse 1, and verse 13. Deliverance from Babylon is clearly in view in this section. Redemption promised. Note also that my servant is a reference to Israel every time, except in 42 verse 1, where it's clearly talking about Jesus. In chapter 49 to 57, the big theme through this section is the provision of redemption. When you read it to a non-Christian, he would think you are reading from the New Testament, from the Gospel. It is that clear. It is clearly talking about Jesus. Redemption provided is my title. Note now that every time you read servant in the singular, it is talking about Jesus. Even in 49 verse 3, I read for you, You are my servant Israel, in whom I will be glorified. It is referring actually not to the nation of Israel, but it refers to Jesus. Jesus was the standalone Israelite, doing what all of Israel is supposed to have done. In chapter 58 to 66, the big theme throughout this section is the experience of redemption. It is mostly about the church age, as well as the age to come, a new heaven and a new earth. This section we can entitle, Redemption Experienced. In the first section of the first, second division, Babylon is the problem, and right in the middle of it, God names Cyrus to be the deliverer of the Jews. God is going to do away with Babylon. In the second section, sin is the problem, and right in the middle of it, which is also right in the middle of the Book of Comfort, is Isaiah 53. God is going to do away with sin. God will not only redeem Israel in the first section, fulfilled in 539 BC, but will extend redemption to the entire world in the second section. Cyrus is God's anointed one, 45 verse 1, so is Christ, the Messiah, which means anointed one too. And see how anointed Cyrus really was. He basically took Babylon without a fight. Isaiah prophesied how the city was taken. Be dry, 
I will dry up your rivers. Chapter 44, verse 27. Daniel didn't need the writing on the wall to know what was going to happen. All he needed was reading the scroll of Isaiah. Cyrus diverted the Euphrates in the middle of the night that flowed through, the ba- through Babylon, the Euphrates that flowed through Babylon. Then his armies marched in over the dry riverbed, while Belshazzar and the Babylonians were drunk and having parties. In one night, the Hebrews were delivered from the Babylonians. How more miraculous can that be? Jesus will do an even greater miracle. In chapter 44, verse 28, God calls Cyrus, He is my shepherd. Thus here we see how shepherd Cyrus foreshadows the ultimate shepherd, Jesus. In 44, verse 26b, what shall this shepherd do? Rebuild the city and the temple. See that in 44, verse 28. Cyrus was instrumental in rebuilding the temple and Jerusalem in 539 BC. And you can read about that in Ezra chapter 1 through 6. Jesus said he would rebuild the temple in three days, referring to the church that was born at his resurrection and he will become the rebuilder of our spiritual lives. In 49 verse 13, Isaiah predicts that he will set the exiles free not for price or reward. The slaves are released from released from Babylon for free. We are released too from sin for free. The gospel is free for everyone. Isaiah 53. Actually, it starts already in chapter 52, verses 13 to 15, with a summary, and then 53 follows. So how it all will end, the author places all the way up front for the reader to see. The servant will be exalted, but before that he will be afflicted, and the people will be in shock. Then in the next chapter, it takes a deep dive into the sufferings the the servant will endure. In 29 verses 13 to 15, I'm sorry, in 29 verses 13 and 14, it already said it will shock the people. Now it says it will astonish the people. It will startle the nations, it says. This revelation about the servant will shock and amaze everybody. In verse 8 it says, Who could have imagined? 53 verses 1 to 3 is a description of Christ being despised, rejected which is an emotional abuse. Then in 53 verses 4 to 6 is Christ depicted as being wounded, which is physically abuse. Then in 53 verses 7 to 9 is Christ depicted as being cut off, which is being killed. Modern Jews still do not know what to do with this passage because they know it talks about a person who takes away the sins of the world or who takes the sins of the world upon himself. The servant shall prosper, be lifted up, be exalted. But this is in stark contrast with what follows. He will be wounded, bruised, oppressed, etc. An onslaught of sufferings follow. The paradox is that he will be lifted up and he will suffer. One detail follows another about how much he will suffer. Over and over again. Picture yourself again in the cinema watching the Passion of the Christ. What Jesus suffered in the movie, as depicted in the movie, is not an exaggeration. Then in 53, verses 10 to 12, is the theology of justification explained. Jesus killed, and that has satisfied something in the eyes of God, and brings in the atonement. There is even a hint of Jesus' Jesus' resurrection because it says in verse 10 and shall prolong his days. Let's read Isaiah chapter 54 verses 1 to 3. Sing, O barren one who did not bear, burst into song and shout, you who have not been in labor. 
for the children of the desolate woman will be more than the children of her that is married, says the Lord. Enlarge the side of your tent, and let the curtains of your habitation be stretched out. Do not hold back. Lengthen your cords and strengthen your stakes. For you will spread out to the right and to the left, and your descendants will possess the nations, and will settle the desolate towns. We have discussed a number of motifs earlier on in the series of lectures on Isaiah. A motif is a recurring theme where imagery is used. For example, a highway is a motif. So is water, or light, or a branch, or a stump. One more motif we're going to talk about, and that is of a woman. In the book of Hosea, we have seen this image of a marriage. The people of God in Israel were prosper, were, were, uh, who, pr who prospered materially, but spiritually they behaved horribly. So God tells the prophet Hosea to marry a prostitute. Everybody knew who she was, and Hosea married her. Then to make a bad thing even worse, she left him and went back to her old profession of prostitution. The message in Hosea was, Israel, though unworthy, was chosen by God, and yet they have turned their backs on God. They made alliances to foreign nations and, by dev and, and devoted themselves to foreign gods. Now, Isaiah picked up on this and used the motif of a woman. The first time he used it, it is in chapter 1 verse 8. Jerusalem is called daughter Zion, a daughter of God. Why daughter? Because God is a father and wants to take care of her. But when you, but when you go on reading, this daughter quickly turned into a prostitute. For example, in chapter 1 verses 21 to 23. Then in chapter 50, verses 1 to 2, the woman has become a divorced mother. Adultery is a ground for divorce in the law of Moses. A certificate of divorce is made and she is put away, cast away. That is what happened in 701 BC, partially. Then again in 605, and then again in 597 BC. But then in 586 BC, totally. People were sent into Babylon because they made alliances with other nations and prostituted, prostituted themselves after foreign gods. Now, in chapter 3 of Hosea, we see that Hosea had a choice. Do I buy the woman back? Do I buy my wife back, basically? Do I pay the price? Now, God had the same question. Do I allow the people to return back to me from exile? God could have left his people to perish in the foreign land. The law of Moses provides also the death penalty for adultery as the alternative to divorce, which is sending her away. So sending her away was considered an act of mercy in the Old Testament. Death penalty would have been deserved. Now, Hosea brought back her wife. God does the Hosea action and buys back his people out of slavery. How did he do that? God made a promise in Isaiah and then fulfilled it in Ezra. In 538 or 539 BC, Cyrus set the people free. They were allowed to return home. So then in 54 verses 1 to 8, the woman is told to rejoice. Rejoice in what? Not just because of the return of the Jews in 538 BC, God's plan was much bigger than that. In fact, 538 BC only foreshadows what God is really going to do. He will not redeem just one people group, but all people groups. God told Abraham, your offspring will possess the nations. This is a promise of spiritual children that is going to come from this woman not only from the Jews, but from the Gentiles. Then in chapter 66, verses 7 to 11, we have the last view of this woman. She will give birth to a new land, 
and a new nation, a prediction of the messianic age. One of our teachers that came to Kona gave us a new set of titles one might use for a horizontal that reflects the issue of trust. One of the major sins repeated throughout the book is pride. Pride says, I rely on myself. In other words, I don't rely on God. I don't trust God. This sin of the people is contrasted with God's holiness at the call of Isaiah in chapter 6. Isaiah brings down the pride of man and lifts up the holiness of God and concludes, In God shall I trust. And calls the people to come back to God, to rely on Him. So chapter 1-6 to six could be entitled, A Call to Trust. We have already seen the contrast that Isaiah made by sharing the story of Ahaz and Hezekiah. So chapter 7-12 to 12 could be entitled, an example of lack of trust. Ahaz did not trust God and rejected God who offered to give him a sign to build trust. But God gave something to trust in, in any way and then mentioned Jesus. In chapter 7-12 to 12, we constantly see this interchange between physical and spiritual deliverance. And God says the reason we have to trust God is because he is going to deliver. Not only physically but also spiritually. Chapter 13 to 24 uh, is pretty much straightforward and it's about judgment on nations. One of the reasons the, the nations are judged is because of pride. Pride usually comes from trusting oneself instead of God. So we could entitle this section, The Nations Misplaced Trust. In chapter 25 to 35, 25 to 35 includes a set of woes. Judah throughout in this book was warned not to place trust in Assyria for protection from Aram and Israel at the siege of Jerusalem in 732 BC. Not to trust in Egypt for help when Assyria besieges Jerusalem in 701 BC. Nor to ally with Babylon when Babylon sent an envoy to make an alliance during that time. So this section could be entitled Judah's Misplaced Trust. Now, chapter 36 to 39 has a story about Hezekiah. Yes, he has his ups and downs when it comes to trusting God. But at the end, he did come through and learn to trust God alone for deliverance. So this section could be entitled, An Example of Trust. Chapter 40 to 48, a text to issue of idolatry. Didn't the people in Judah believe in Jehovah? Yes, but they weren't sure whether the gods that were worshipped in the other nations really didn't exist. Instead, they compared Yahweh with idols. So they needed to know that you can't do that because God is not an idol. God is totally different. An idol can't help you. It doesn't see, hear or speak. But I do, God says. So this section could be entitled, Trust God, Not Idols. Chapter 49 to 57 go straight to the source of our salvation and this is realized uh, right in the middle chapter 53 so this section could therefore be entitled the foundation for trust chapter 58 to 66 is the last section and primarily looks forward to the future Isaiah saw something 700 years before John did in the book of Revelation. A new heaven and a new earth. The new Jerusalem, nations coming to Zion. Basically, he's talking about the nations and then seeing the nation. The kingdoms of the world have become the kingdom of our God. Revelation 11 verse 15. So this section could be entitled, A Future to Trust in. Hasn't he earned our trust? The book has a great ending about the new heaven and the new earth. No more weeping, no grief, no sorrows. 
God's presence will be with his people for all eternity. Wonderful. But wait a minute. It came with a price. Someone bore our grief and sorrow. We read that in chapter 53. After Isaiah 53, the rest of the book cannot be read the same. God is different. Different from all those idols. He became very much like us. Emmanuel. A child became a man. A man who died for us on a cross. Meditate on chapter 53 in context of the main theme in this book, which is what? This book is about trust. If true that he bore our grief, he was bruised for our iniquities, then isn't he trustworthy? Jesus is really for us. Isn't he then not worthy of our trust? Verse 